Okay, we're back. There's all this stuff. Okay. Yes, question to start us off. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just before we start going into all this, yeah. uh, next week we don't have class. Yes. Class. Okay, good. I'm done. Non-trivial portion of the course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So like yeah like like the cicadas every seven years this course meets on Independence Day, um, and uh, so you know we, we try the best that we can. Um, how can I help you in that? Uh, so clearly uh, you know I'm going to be off you know setting things on fire in my neighborhood and trying to make sure the things I set on fire aren't my kids. So uh, I won't be able to attend class, uh, and the university's closed anyway. I'm sure you know it's just going to be. Again, that bassoon player guy you know, practicing uh, here on, on Independence Day. Um, we've got options. So uh, the easiest thing for me to do would be to point you at the recording from week two last year. It's essentially the same thing, although the assignments aren't exactly the same. I don't know how well that's going to work. Um, I could put together a screencast on my own time and give it to you guys, and you could watch it in lieu of the class. Um, I'm happy to do that. That probably takes like you know two hours of my time on you know the weekend or on a Tuesday night or something like that. Would that work? Um, then I can at least introduce stuff to you. Um, and how and how about this? How about on next two? So I'll try to do that over the weekend. And then how about next Tuesday night? Um, I'll I'll send out a, a link to a, a Google Hangout. And I can have some office hours on Tuesday night. So if you've got questions, you can ask me then. So then I guess what I'm asking you guys to do is uh, if I can get, let's say I get the um, screencast done by Sunday night, uh, then I'd like you to watch it on Monday or Tuesday. And then Tuesday evening, we can have office hours. And then if we get, need to get check in again, like over the weekend again, I'm, ha I'm happy to have a, a Google Hangout. How does that sound? Give it a try. Okay, uh, I can do that. Yeah, Ben. How quickly would the turnaround be for getting people who are wanting to get in before the end of the I'm going to do that tonight. So I'm going to email the department. So well, uh, so then definitely by the end of this week, you should know. I think if there are people that are registered to not attend, I'm going to email them tonight. I'll probably give them to like noon tomorrow to tell me otherwise. Then by you know sort of yes tomorrow afternoon, I will email the department and say, okay, these people, you know. These people live, these people die. All right, there you go. Uh, so I'll do that. Yeah. So then, then, and of course, I will, uh, at that point, I'll also email you as individuals uh, if someone who was waitlisted gets added to the course. Yeah. Uh, so will the project be building on projects? Yes. Yep. The, uh, well, hmm. uh, projects one, two, and three are all from the same archetype, uh, but that same, and then there's a new project type for archetype. Project, for project, new archetype for project four, and another archetype for project five. But you'll be using the same code. You'll basically copy it in to the new project. Okay. Well, project, we'll, project one, one through yeah, and it'll be much more clear once we start talking about project one. Okay. People get it. Okay. Good. Did everybody fill in one of the little cards? You didn't fill in a card. Oh, super important that you do. <laughs> okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So, quick recap. So, and so far in class, we've yep did all the minutes trivia of looking at the syllabus, all that good stuff. Um, then we started looking at uh, our, product, our, our this, this simple student application for uh, the student application to sort of uh, start to see what it's like working uh, with Java and working with IntelliJ and working with Maven. So uh, next thing I want to talk to you about is unit testing. So we have our code which is our student class, and we want to make sure, and this, this student class is supposed to do things, right? It's got, got these methods that have, uh, that have some behavior. So like the says method, you know, always says this, student, this class is too much work. And uh, the toString 
prints a description as uh, specified in the assignment. And we'll go back to that in a little while. Now, you now, granted, this is simple, and I'm sure you know all of you can just go ahead and implement it, and that would be well and good. How do you know it works? Oh, it's so simple. I'm a smart person. I probably got it right. Well, you probably got it right, but how do you know? How confident are you that your code is right? Now, I mean, for the simple project, yeah, you're all going to figure out the first time. But as things get more and more complicated, there's more and more functionality, uh, you're going to want to know. You want to be able to validate that. And that's what automated testing is all about, is providing that validation. Providing that validation that what you've done so far is correct. And probably more importantly, as you continue to make more changes, as you continue to evolve and add to your programs, you can go back and validate that you haven't broken anything. And... I know I can speak from experience, but I bet a lot of you two can think back to a time where it's like you thought you had everything working, and then you, you know, uh, then all of a sudden things stopped working, and you didn't know what you did to break it, and so you're going back and replaying things, and I don't know about you, but I've got these panic modes where I'm like, I'm just trying stuff, and things aren't compiling, and things are breaking all over the place. Um, unit tests, what they allow you to do is if you work in these really small chunks, you find out immediately when something breaks. Like you make one change and, oh look, the thing I just did 30 seconds ago broke this other test case. Oh, I didn't realize those, are, those two were connected. And you have these learnings much faster because you have very rapid feedback. And that's what unit testing gives you. Um, so the, the archetype creates uh, this thing called a student test. So uh, this test leverages a framework called JUnit. Uh, which is for unit testing uh, J Java code. And unit testing, uh, sorry, JUnit, uh, the, the framework, uses some conventions um, and some what are called annotations to identify which uh, methods in a, uh, well, which classes and then which methods in those classes are meant to be tests. So by convention, um, a class named student test, which is off in this test directory, will test the class student up here. So there's student and then there's student test. And when you have a public void method that is annotated with the uh, with a test annotation, we say at test before the method declaration, the JUnit framework recognizes this as a test that needs to be run. Now unit tests, um, and really actually I like to think of as all tests, sort of have three components. A, a test has a, um, a setup step where they establish some condition. They have an action step where they do something, perform some operation. This is usually the code that's under test. And then they have a validation step that validates that the expected thing happened. Right? That's what you're looking to do. You're looking to validate expectations. But in order to do that, you need to set the stage, you need to perform some operation, and then you validate that it's true. Another way to think about it is um, uh, sort of a, a three clauses in a sentence. Given, when, and then. So given some, uh, you know, some situation, uh, sorry, given some uh, setup is, has taken place, something, uh, th there is a condition. Uh, given that I do, so sorry, when I do something, then I expect something to happen. So given, when, and then. And I'll talk more about that later. This right here is a, a very simple test that tests that when you have a student whose name is Pat, you assert that, well, their name is Pat. So what do you do? Uh, I have a variable called uh, Pat. Um, I create a new student object. And remember, our student constructor uh, takes so the first parameter is a name. The second one is the classes. The third is the GPA. And the last is a gender. Uh, and there, I have a student. Then their name is Pat. And they're not taking any classes. And they have a zero GPA. It doesn't matter. So this is sort of the, uh, the given. The when is when I create a new student, I assert that Pat's name, so when I say get name from Pat, is equal to the name variable that I sent in. This is a very simple test, right? Um, but it sort of shows the pattern and it's going to get us started in writing more complex, uh, complex tests. So this at test annotation is part of the JUnit API. If we look at our imports, there's org JUnit test. We've used ArrayList from Java Util. And we've also used these things from this Hamcrest library. Um, I'm not going to go into details. There's some good stuff in the JUnit lecture all about it. But suffice it to say that it provides you with methods like assert that and equal to, which give you a nice human readable syntax, human readable language for expressing these assertions. 
So again, your unit test consists, each unit test consists of three phases, the, the setup, the given, so given that you've got a name of Pat, when I create, I take some action, I create a new student with the name of Pat and a bunch of other boilerplate, then I expect that Pat's name is equal to name. IntelliJ lets me run this test really easily by clicking the run right here. It gives me a nice little visual feedback. It says, oh, great, everything's green, all the tests have passed. And then you have the output, uh, anything written to standard error, standard out, uh, shows up over here. So very simple unit tests. I'm about to show you a video that's going to talk more about test and development. Before I go to that, I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, ask any questions you might have about this very simple unit test. Nope. Okay. Moving on. So, unit tests are just more code that you write to verify the actual program's code, the, the important stuff. This led to um, this led to a ethic. This led, led to a practice. We'll call it that way um, of something called test-driven development. And uh, there is a a process that you go through with test-driven development that takes you from the first thing that you do is you write a failing test, <clears throat> then you write the code to make that test pass, and then you go through and see if you can improve the code, make things nicer. It's called the red green refactor. Um, phase. And I have a, uh, a video, admittedly kind of silly, um, from uh, Uncle Bob Martin, who is a well-known uh, software developer, uh, trains people on software. Uh, he's written a, uh, well, he's written some books um, about clean code and software craftsmanship that I highly recommend. Um, and he also has a, a video series uh, called The Clean Coders, where he talks about all sorts of really uh, Good modern techniques for, for building software. This here is a clip that he's allowed uh, people to use for, for free uh, where he uh, introduces test-driven development by doing some test-driven development on a simple uh, bowling application. i got to warn you, he's kind of an acquired taste. Uh, he's Uncle Bob. It's like funny Uncle Bob. Um, and not like funny, he funny, funny, but he's, he tries to you know, joke around. But anyway, you know, he's a, he's a middle-aged guy. Happens to the best of us. We, you know can't make the jokes that we made when we were 20 because we've now realized those are completely inappropriate, especially for a public setting. So um, I'll get started here. I think all of the audio and video should work okay. Oh, it's time for the red green refactor cycle. And I am in the red phase. I must write a failing unit test. All right, what test must I write that will force me to write public class game? Well, I'm going to write um, uh, can create game. Uh, game G equals new game. Oh, heavens. Thank you, IDE. Helpful, IDE. That's enough of that. Heavens to Murgatroyd, that doesn't compile. Well, I must make it compile. So now, I'm going to create the class game. Yes, in the current package, there it is, the class game. And if I go back to my test, oh, look, the test passes. It's time for me to go to the green phase. I am now green. And in the green phase, it's time for me to refactor. Is there anything I can refactor here? No. Nothing to refactor. Very good. Then I am done with this test. I am passing. Lovely. Back to the red face. The next test. Well, I know I want to write that roll method. All right. Uh, test um, can roll. Uh, oh, heavens, I need a game. Uh, game G equals new game. Lovely. Uh, G dot roll. What should I roll? Well, let's roll a zero. Hmm, that doesn't compile. Okay, time for me to focus on making it work. Uh, I'm going to create the method roll. Ha, look at that, roll. And it should take a pins. This is lovely. And I believe that that will pass. 
because I'm not actually testing anything. Oh, time for me to refactor. I've got a passing test. Uh, what's to refactor? Oh, goodness, I've got duplicate code here. Duplicate code. Well, I better take that and refactor that out. I'll create a field named G. I will uh, initialize it in the uh, setup method, which of course I don't have, but this will create. I'll keep it private. Lovely. So now I've got a nice setup method. It's going to create the 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 game. It'll put it in the public in the private field G. Uh, can create game is now empty because well it doesn't do anything. And um, I think I can get rid of that line of code in can roll. And all of this should still pass. It does. I think I can get rid of that empty test now. This is common, by the way. You write a test just to delete it later. Lovely. Hmm. Next most interesting test case. Back to red. Well, what can I make fail now? Um, oh, I got to write the score function. Ooh, but I can't call score until I roll a complete game. Okay, so here we get into some of the technicalities of test-driven development. When you must write real code, you write the simplest real code you can. In this case, I'm going to have to roll a complete game. What is the simplest, most degenerate complete game that I can roll? A gutter game. Let's roll the gutter game. Uh, okay, um, um, four, int i equals zero, i less than how many balls in a gutter game? Twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, i plus plus, uh, g dot roll zero, that will roll twenty zeros, that is a gutter game. And now we will assert that the score is zero. Oh heavens, that doesn't compile. I must make it pass. Excellent. I will make this compile. It should return an int. I'll have it return a negative one, because I still want to see it fail. It should fail. Yes. And now I will make it pass by returning a zero. This is stupid, but it's also easy. And I have now seen my test both pass and fail. I know my test works. It cost me nothing, but I now know that my test will fail if I don't get a zero. Ah, well, that was nice. What is the next most interesting test case? Or is there any refactoring to do? Mm, no. Next most interesting test case. Okay, happy coding. Okay. What did you observe about what Uncle Bob was doing? Sorry, I can't hear you. What? First, yeah, right. Write the test first. Yep. And then, what did he do after he wrote the test? Actually, what there was interesting. There was an important property of the test. And what was that? Yes. A simple test, and, and and yep, and it's a simple test that fails the first time, right? He says you have to see it fail. Now, now, why is that? That's right. You need to make sure that your test actually does what it's supposed to do. I've made this mistake before many times, where it's like, oh, good, it passes. I'm all happy, right? And it's like, oh, no, no. <laughs> the code wasn't actually doing the right thing. There was a problem with the test. Or that uh, there was, yeah, some, some other behavior that was happening, not the one that I wanted to test. So that's important. OK, so the first thing you do is you write a test, and you see it fail. You see it read. Then what do you do? Right. You make the test pass. How do you make the test pass? Simplest way possible by implementing the code that's under test, right? And now we saw, you know, he, he had a very simple example where he's like, okay, great, you know, the score is always zero. That will be the final code, but it's the code that makes the test pass. And that's important. And, and, and that's an important part of the test-driven development discipline. Um, 
And it's one that's kind of hard to do, isn't it, right? Because I don't know if, about you, but like when I look at the problem I want to solve, it's like, great, I can see like the entire solution in my head and it's going to be great. And then I start coding and I get, realize that I'm like, oh, wow, I'm like, you know, three classes into it. And I don't remember what I was originally thinking about. It's really easy to get lost. So uh, one of the things I've learned over the years is that this discipline that TDD requires you to have pays off in the long run. It's kind of one of those investments where it's like, hey, you need to move slowly, move quickly, right? <laughs> Um, so you know, take the little steps, get the validation and feedback at every little step on the way, and you'll have a really confident and solid foundation to build more stuff on. So you write a failing test, you make it pass, and then what's the last thing that he did? Refactor. refactor. What does refactoring mean? Simplify, make things cleaner. Yeah, like, like, make your code cleaner, make your code nicer. So you know, remember what his example was? Yep, he had duplicate code. He created a new game twice, and he was like, wait, you know, all these test cases have uh, a new game in it. Why don't I just put, move that code to one place, initialize that code in one place in the setup method, store it off in a field, so that way I don't need it anymore. Yeah. He was refactoring the unit tests. Right, he was refactoring the unit tests, too. Um, te unit tests are code. They deserve to be clean. They deserve to be, uh, you know, just as e just as easy to read, just as uh, you know, as easy to read, as easy to evolve as your as your production code. What are other observations do you have about uh, about what you just saw? Anything else? No? So here's what I'm going to do now. We'll turn back to IntelliJ. And uh, let's write some, uh, let's do some test driven development here. Those of you who have laptops, why don't you bring up the uh, assignment? Actually, let me go review the assignment for everybody um, again. We'll walk through this now with an eye towards what are the tests that we need to write to make this work. So I'll just look at the code. Yes, please do. Oh, uh, I should compile on Babbage. Uh, what version of? Oh wait. They they run Java ten. You just need to tell them to Java ten. Okay. Let actually yeah, that's a great question. Let's take a moment, uh, and I will. Uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, so the question is, hey, I tried using it on the CS Department Linux machine, so use Babbage or you know, this is Ruby. There's also Ada and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, uh, ah, I, I I did I followed everything in the assignment. What's not working? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you use this package guy and then you go down to Java 10, you can install. So if you use add package, uh, yep, it's to manage to manage your path. Uh, it's all on there. Thank you, cat guys. I made the request and like two hours later, and like on a Saturday night too, I kind of wonder about it. Uh, you know, it was, it was like all turned around. It was super awesome. Uh, so yes, you can get it there. What was that again? Add package. It has one cancel in this. A D D. Yes, and so I'll, I'll show you how to do that. So, okay, um, you know what? I guess I didn't ask the cat guys to put package support for Maven. Maybe they could. Um, I, I'm, I'm old school. I learned Unix the, actually it was easy for me back, well, the, the hard way back in the 90s uh, and, and stuff. So the way I think about this is that I add stuff to the path variable, um, which is I think essentially what the add package stuff does too. But anyway, I've got all this stuff on my path. What I recommend that you do, and I think this might be in one of the screencasts. Um, so if you're using Bash, which is I think the default shell on the CX Linux machines, um, in my, uh, so lsu whitlock.bashrc, no, uh, you, uh, oh, it's the wrong, I should log in as me, not as the greater. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh -huh. Jeez, really? Uh, I'm on camera. 
Okay, dot bash rc. So uh, this is my bash profile, and somewhere in here, uh, I'm sure I have Java home set. Yeah. So I set it to slash pkgs packages slash Java slash JDK dash uh, 1001, um, which is, I think, what the, uh, the package manager gets you. I also have, is it M2 home? No, Maven home. What do I? Yeah. Um, I maintain a symbolic link for my tools directory to the latest version of Maven. So if you add, if you set your Maven home to this and put Maven home on your path, you'll get the right one. Um, but yes, so then there's a little bit of environmental configuration that you need in order to use the CS Department's Linux machines, but uh, you will be submitting all of your homework from those machines, so you need to make it work. So you need to make it and your local setup work. And I think there's, uh, on the screencast is probably out of date with regards to versions, but I think the mechanism is still the same. If you look at this getting started with Java um, uh, slide deck, it's got, uh, it's got information on how to do that. Yeah, question? I don't know if I misunderstood, but do you have to use the tools? You will be submitting your uh, projects, and I will be grading your projects on the CS Partners machines. So therefore, it behooves you, well, I mean, you kind of have to make them work on those machines. You can develop them, though, on any machine you want. So what I recommend is that you develop it locally, use GitHub to transfer the source code up to the PSU machines, and then uh, run it one more time, like, you know, do a, uh, you know, run all your unit tests, make sure all your code works on the, uh, on the CS Part machine machines, submit it, we'll talk about submitting next time, um, and then I'll, but then I, well, I run the scripts, the graders assign the grade, um, all on the CS Partners machines. Good questions. Yay. Okay. You see the bash profile setting there in the slides? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the slides, I, I, think the, I think the screencast, I walked through that. Um, I can't remember, though. They might not be in the slides. They might be in the screencast. Okay. I don't remember. They, they probably, they, yeah, I don't think I'd take, like, yeah, they're probably not in the slide slides. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it would help if someone to remind me. So, if someone post to Google Plus and say, "Hey, remember how you said you know showed us that stuff in class really quickly?" Please write it here so I can explain it. Here, I understand it. Yep. Thank you. Okay. We were looking at the project. That's what we were doing. Okay. We're creating a simple human class. Let's talk about the behavior of this uh, human class. The basically the stuff that we need to implement. And the way we'll implement it is by writing a test that verifies that behavior, and then we'll implement that behavior. So you have a student. The student has a name, takes uh, zero more classes, has a GPA, and has a gender. Has some methods. All students say this class is too much work. And it has a two string, which puts out a description. The example of that description is down below. It's got a main method that parses the command line and prints a description of the student. And then as an example of this, when you run this command line with these command line arguments, it should print out something that looks like this. So this is, so that highlighted text right here is what the two string prints out. So ultimately what we need to do is write a program. So it's basically like the, the user facing functionality is that when you provide these command line arguments, or command line arguments that look like this, then uh, this is written to standard out. But let's go there last. Let's start instead with implementing just the simple, uh, just the functionality, it won't be simple, the, the functionality that's here in the, uh, the student class and its, its instance methods, and we'll worry about the main program secondarily. So let me start down the path, and I'll propose, uh, I'll propose a, a test, um, and then you can help me write it. Okay. Uh, when I, well, I'll ask you guys first. What do you think like, the simplest part of this class is? The, like the simplest thing that we could make work? Maybe you could use the constructor. What about the constructor? Oh, I see, just creating it. True. Ah, okay. 
th th there's some good ideas. Let's um, let's take a moment to explore that. So, what are some interesting test cases for uh, for the GPA? And I'm just going to like make some here in a comment. So, uh, interesting test cases for GPA. Okay. So GPA, yep. And you know what? And that's a kind of an implied. Uh, that, that's an implied requirement. But let's let's do that. Let's, let's make it. It's our class. We can do that. Okay. So uh, okay. So GPA is uh, well, must be must be uh, less than uh, 4.0. By the way, you've probably noticed that when I do certain things, like this big green bar uh, appears at the bottom of the screen. You'll see me, uh, you'll see me do more of this. When I use a keyboard shortcut, I've got the special plug into IntelliJ that like shouts it out and says, oh, hey, you just did, you know, this thing. Like, okay, like um, I can do uh, control shift F10. And that runs a unit test. Uh, or I can do control, or what is that? Control shift R, I guess, also runs it. No, it's replace. Wait, that's, yep. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, once I start refactoring and stuff, I'll be using more uh, keyboard shortcuts. But uh, that, that, that little pop-up there is to help you figure out what I'm doing if, in case I forget to like use a menu item or something. So anyway, so like, yeah, when I just did whatever I did, you know, when I did this or something like that. No, I don't know what I did there. Okay, sorry. I'm all over the place. So, okay, GPA must be less than 4.0. What else about the GPA would be interesting to, to test? Okay. Must be, okay, cannot be negative. Anything else? Oh yeah. Nice. Yep. You know what? I, let's write the test for this now, since it's on the since it's on our minds. Um, that we get rid of that. Oops, I'm gonna get rid of that again. Good. Okay, so let's write a test. Um, so GPA. Uh, must be less than 4.0. Oops. This is the avoid method. Given when then, what is the what is sort of like the, the setup? What what is the, uh, the, the the state that we need to be in given? Okay. So, uh, like you have, uh, sorry, is GPA a float, I think? Uh, float GPA of, okay, yep. So what should the GPA be? 4.1, okay. So given, oh, uh, actually, is it a float or is it double? Is it, yay, double, okay. Okay. So given that, when, what's the when here? What, what's the thing that we do? Okay. What's the name of the student? Who cares? Yep. Classes, zero classes, new array list. Uh, GPA is GPA, and gender doesn't matter. Okay. What's the then? What should happen? Throw an exception. What do you think? What do you think about throwing an exception? Okay. Okay. Uh, how do we make sure an exception is thrown? Uh, yeah, there's a couple ways you could do it. Uh, there is kind of the very explicit way. And we'll catch, what kind of exception do we expect to be thrown? Oops, oops, I delete something. No, this is the win. 
How about an illegal argument exception? Grammar exception. Now, you guys know about exceptions, right? The whole idea is that, hey, I'm executing some piece of code, and, ah, something bad happens, and then, uh, most importantly, the next line of code isn't executed. Execution stops. So if we somehow get to this line of code right here where the cursor is, the test is invalid, right? So we should fail the test. I don't know. Sort of fail. There we go. Okay, so this is nice and explicit. Actually, is there a pass? I don't think there is a pass method. Nope. Okay, so look what we've done here. Okay, we said, okay, given that there's some GPA of 4.1, when we create a new student with that GPA, we expect that legal argument exception will be thrown. And if it's not, we want the test to fail. Okay. So what do you think will happen when we run this test? It fails. Yay. It fails with an assertion error here on line 31. I can click there, and sure enough, oh, it got to line 31. Well, it wasn't supposed to get to line 31. Okay, what do we need to do? Okay, and where is that code going to be? In the student class someplace. Okay, so here we are in the constructor. We got the GPA. So what do I need to do to, to, to write to make it, uh, make it pass? Okay, and I need to throw the exception when... Right, so I was like, oh, but wait, we also want it to be less than zero. Shouldn't I write that code now? No. Right? It's this discipline you need to have. It's like, oh, I know the next thing I want to write. I know this, right? It, it, it's really unnatural. It's like, you know, you've gotten this far by just like, oh my god, I got through my course by like, you know, do, doing all this stuff. You, you got to like take this step back and you really need to uh, hold yourself back to have this discipline because otherwise you'll forget to write the other test. That's what I've always found anyway. It's like, oh yeah, right, I know I need to do this and you forget to write the test and then if you've gotten something wrong, you'll never know about it. So, yep. Uh, patience Daniel-san, right? It's like that whole thing. You know that movie that your parents used to like? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so uh, GPA must be uh, less than or cannot be greater than. I don't know. Cannot be greater than uh, 4.0. Okay, let's run it again and see what happens. Woo! It passed. Accomplishment. Okay, so that was the red, the green. Let's go back and refactor. Um, there is a uh, there is a refactoring that I want to do, and that's the following. So we use this syntax where we had a try catch block, makes it nice and um, explicit. But there's something that I uh, want to actually. You're looking. Like you're asking a question. Sorry. Yeah. It's not very clear because yep. you know, not the nitpick, but yep. you know, it sounds like you're a hard grader. No one can get a four point. They can't. Oh, no one could get a 4.0? Oh, really? And so if your code said if something yep. has greater than 4.0, then throw an exception, but I mean, it just doesn't your, your name is your uh, no, Naming of what? So it says GPA must be less than 4.0. Oh, less than or equal to. Class, Thank you. Yep. This is my only classes term. Mm -hmm. I would not get it. So you're, ah, right, you're saying that the name of the uh, of the method should not it's not just that it's less than it must be less than or equal to. Excellent, good. Less than or equal to. Nice. I think you also reminded me that it's like we want to make sure that a 4.0 uh, GPA is possible. So I'm not going to run this write this test yet, but it's something we should test, right? Because you know otherwise, yeah. Show up at the, the registrar's office there. It's like, oh, I got my 4.0 right now. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, there's one refactoring that I wanted to do this test, though. Um, and this is uh, another way of expressing this test that is a little cleaner. The test annotation has a parameter called uh, expected that, um, uh, that, uh, that specifies the type of exception that is expected to be thrown. So here it's a legal argument exception dot class. And now you can get rid of all of this stuff. So right, it's a little less code. It makes it a little easier to read. And now I can just rerun this guy. Yay, he's all happy. OK. So 4.0 GPA is possible. What, what do we need to do to implement this? And then we sort of like the win and the then we expect that's okay. 4.0. We'll run this. Eh. Pat. Well, and this is sort of the trick, right? Where it's like, ah, oh, sometimes it's like you can't write the test that makes it, you know, the, the, the test won't fail because the way you implemented that. I mean, and so then it's sort of a, it, it's a call. It's like, well, should I go back and like break the student only to unbreak it? That seems kind of dumb. So it's like this I see more of as just like uh, guardrails or a safety net just to make sure, uh, you know, yeah. It, it, uh, so it's like, you always want you want to strive for writing a failing test, but I don't think you can achieve it every time without doing something stupid. So, but this is good though, right? We have this here as a safety net, so if we ever do something to break it, we'll know that you know that okay, we can't have a 4.0 GPA uh, anymore. Okay, so we've gone from red to green. Uh, are we ready to refactor? Yeah, there's an, well, it ought not fail. Um, yeah. Which might happen as part of a refactor, part of right. So this is like why it's a nice safety net. There, there is no explicit then. There's no explicit test. Um, there, you know, student doesn't have a get GPA method. I suppose we could add one, uh, but I think here it's just like hey, I can create one with uh, a 4.0, and that's cool. So it, it, both the the when and the then are the same clause, are the same code. That's okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I spy with my little eye an opportunity to refactor. Do you? GPA is declared twice. Student is created twice. So let's just do that. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to say instead of like having this duplicate code. I want to uh, create the student in one method. I'm going to use IntelliJ's refactoring tools to say refactor extract method from the selected code. And I'm going to call it uh, create student with GPA. And look at IntelliJ. It's like, hey, I saw that you've got like this exact same piece of code up here. Do you want to replace it also? And I say, yes, I do. Yay! Now it's all there. Why is that highlighted in yellow? Because the return value is never used. Okay, well, that's okay. Uh, I guess we don't need it. So let's, can I autocorrect that? Make method void. That's nice. Okay, cool. And uh, the code's a little simpler. You know, this way, you know, we might have to change things down here. We'll have to change it in one place. That's kind of nice. Okay. See any, any, other, any other opportunities for refactoring? Anything over here? Eh, not yet. Okay, let's run our tests again. Let's run all of our tests again. So run all the tests in the student class. Yay, all three tests pass. I'm done. At this point, I like to commit my code. 
I've got something working. It's stable. I'm happy with the passes, uh, tests are green. I want to hear again. Draw that line in the sand. Take that checkpoint and say, hey, I, uh, everything's working. So I'm going to go over here to the uh, version control panel. I'm going to quickly uh, take a look at what I've changed here. Uh, when files show up in blue, uh, it means that they've been locally modified. Um, I can do things like uh, I can look at the changes by, uh, where is the diff? I don't remember. Um, show diff. Oh, yeah, the two arrows, like, like this, I guess. That's diff. I'll just use open apple D there. And so I can look at my changes. I can use F7 to like navigate through them. It's like, oh yeah, right, this is what I added, although I just added it, so I'm not, I don't need to review them that much. And I can say, great, now I can commit it. So I can say commit or command K. It gives me, it prompts for me for a little message. So this is doing all the stuff that I used to do on the command line with the git commit. I can do it inside the IDE, don't need to change tools. And I can say, uh, what can I say? Uh, added a simple uh, unit test for a GPA uh, that, well, to, that ensures, that ensures that GPAs uh, must be less than or equal to, equal to 4.0. Cool. I can just commit it straight to the local repository, or I can push it all the way up to GitHub so that the entire world can see it. Yeah, it doesn't like my password, but yet it works every time. I don't quite understand. And now I go back to GitHub, I refresh the page, and sure enough, there it is. Yay. OK. Let's write another. Um, let's see here. So we did the uh, must be less than or equal to 0 uh, to 4.0. That's cool. GPA cannot be negative. So then let's write that test. What does that look like? It must not be negative. Yes. Must, well, or how about must be positive? Or greater than or equal to zero. Oh, so greater than zero. So what does that look like? Well, so by this test, that's true. But I don't know if that's necessarily right or not. So I think I, I like the way you're thinking, though, because you're hinting at uh, so like yeah, minus one or whatever. You're hinting at like, oh, there are more test cases that we need to do. Uh, create student with GPA and notice there's like tab complete and stuff, right? You know, saves your fingers. Um, GPA. Okay, so now if I run that, no, oh, passes. That's wrong because you're right. This is supposed to be, we should have accepted expected an exception. Now we'll try it. It failed. Got an illegal argument exception. Actually, since things are failing, I want to show you something else. So I have a failing test right now. I'm going to go back to the command line. I'm going to go back to Maven, and I'm going to say uh, what Maven verify, which like runs everything end to end. I just want to show you what happens when a unit test fails in Maven, like this. I'll red on the screen, and so it basically tells you the same thing that IntelliJ does. It says, "Oh yeah, this test failed, and it expected an illegal argument exception." So Maven will also give you that same feedback. Okay, uh, we want to make it. Uh, we want to make it pass. How do we do that? Go to the student class, right? So I can do uh, interesting. Really, Command O. No, no, no. Okay. Um, uh, student. And here, okay, we want to say if GPA is less than zero, less than zero, try it again. Yay, it passes. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, that might be a deficiency in our class then. We might want to verify that the message with the exception is correct, maybe. 
I'll leave it as an exercise to the student. Is the professor's too lazy. And uh, okay, this is cool. Uh, oops, student test. Um, and then uh, let's take let's make an analog of this test, which is as zero GPA as possible. Okay, cool. Move from red to green. Opportunities to refactor. Yeah. I've got a, just a question uh, in the video. Uh, uh, Bob Martin had uh, he had syntax that looked like uh, throws in the signature throws exception. Oh, yeah, yeah. Throw, yeah throw Might have been, yeah. Um, and then you have it. You have your expected your unit tests decorated with uh, exception expected exception. Yep. Exception. But I haven't seen the syntax of like two passes before. Just the signature says well, Let me see. Uh, do we have what that looks like? Uh, oh, like right here? Yeah. Yeah, he's got some macro or whatever that he uses to create tests. Um, I don't I don't think I have that same macro. I don't uh, let's see here. What does he just have? Is it a test or something? Yeah. He has something to find in his IDE, or maybe that was an older version of that. Maybe it was kind of old. Maybe an older version of IntelliJ had that. Um, was that in his class? That, I thought that was that was his test. It's at test. Um, uh, maybe it's yeah, test paren paren. Oh, maybe he's got some magical. Ex I, you know, I don't know. I think that's what I'm saying. Um, that I, I, from what I recall, that's some sort of like a template or macro that he can enable or something. Um, that would save me some typing. The whole throws exception though is like. Um, there's checked versus unchecked exceptions, and so if you have like checked exceptions, then you have to declare it. Um, and so then, if your code like for an I/O exception or something else that is checked, then your test has to uh, uh, declare that. So that's probably why his template has that. But so far, none of our code has thrown a checked exception. They've thrown unchecked exceptions, like a legal argument exception. And there's in one of the lectures I go into detail on that. Good question though. Okay, um, you know, there, there's a refactoring that I was thinking about doing. Um, now that we have this nice create student with GPA method, is this GPA variable really useful? I don't, I don't think so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inline this. I'm going to say refactor, and I'm going to say inline. And what that will do is take the, the value, uh, it says you remove all references to the value, and then remove the variable. So it just puts 4.1 in there. And you know, I still, still think that's readable. I still think that makes sense. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and inline that. What do you guys think? Yeah. Better like this or better like, like that? Uh, you like that? Yeah, me too. OK. Now we'll run everybody again. I can run the entire class from there. Pardon me, get a little parched. Yay, and everybody's happy. Okay. Eight o'clock. Let's just do one more. And so let's see here. We we got that done. Any other any other GPA tests that we want to write? No? Yeah, didn't think so. Okay, let's check this in. And then let's take another uh, quick break. Um, so like I added another unit you know, test for uh, GPA, this time less than zero. OK, awesome. Let's take like a seven minute break. Um, so come back when the big hand is on the one. <laughs>